Epithelial tissues have uh, the basement membrane and the apical surface. Uh, so if you look at this, there are three, two ways that we can classify epithelial tissues. We can classify it based on the number of layers and based on the number of cells. So based on the number of layers, it can be simple, which is what you see here. It can be one layer. If it's one layer, we call it simple epithelium. If it is two layer, we call it stratified. Or if it is more, stratified means stratum, like layers. So if it is two or more layers, we still call it stratified. <laughs> then pseudo stratified means that it's appearing to be simple. It's appearing to be multiple layers, rather, but it's not multiple layer. And you know, the best way I explain that is just like um, you have a house that looks tall from the outside, but by the time you got inside, you discover that it's just one story building because there's no staircase, there's no second floor everywhere, it's just one story, but it has eye ceiling, something like that. All right, so let's go. I will talk about that. I'm trying not to stay on some things too long. Then we can classify epithelial tissues as well based on their the shape of the cell. If we look at it based on the shape of the cell, we have four types, majorly three, then the fourth one. The first one is that some epithelial tissues could be called squamous epithelial tissues. The squamous epithelial tissues All right, so uh, squamous is flat, and I will show it to you in a bit. Uh, it's flat cells. It's not, it's not long. It, the breadth is longer than the length. So we call it squamous cells. Um, then cuboida, of course, it looks like a cube, but don't forget cells are head, cells and cells. They are not boxes, so they may not necessarily have edges. But when you look at it, it has the appearance of this is a cube. Then columna is long, like we say it is tall and slender. We call that columna. And then transitional means it could shift, it could change from one shape to another. And the best example to think about is your urinary bladder. When your urinary, when your urine is, um, when your when the urinary bladder is empty, they all look like cuboida. But when it is full, the bladder is going to shift. It's going to stretch out because it is full. When it stretch out, the cells now appear to be color, uh, squamous because it's going to stretch and, be, and appear flat. So that kind of epithelium, we call it uh, transitional. So if you come here, for instance, now you see this is simple squamous epithelium. So the way we name is that you pick one, but one criteria here, then you pick one criteria here. So the first thing you want to check is this. How many layer is this cell? If it is one layer, that means it is simple. If it is two layer, that means stratified. If it is still, if it a layer, if it is two or more, stratified. If it's the one that appears to be stratified but is not, um, then we say it is pseudo-stratified. And I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> so like this now. It is simple, then the cell is squamous. So now, this is simple, squamous. It means that it's simple and the cells are flat. So it is simple, squamous epithelium. Now these tissues, you see them majorly, you see them, some of them are in the kidney, you see it in the lungs, um, you see it, in lining, endothelial lining, the heart, blood vessels, those are, tis are tissues that are in such area. Their job majorly is to reduce friction, the control um, vessel permeability, the perform absorption and secretion. All right, let's go. Now, the second one here is simple, meaning that it's one layer, then it's cuboida, meaning that it appears like a cube. 
Now, so you see, it obviously appear like a cube. This is also in kidney, but it's in the tubular area where they do more of secretion and absorption, more of like tubular area. All right, so you see it in uh, glands, you see where they do secretions. Um, you see it in dots, you see it in portion of kidney tubules in thyroid gland. Those are where you see simple cuboida, right? Now the third one is simple columna. Now you see these cells of course look tall and slender. It is simple cuboida, I mean columna. Um, you see it majorly around the stomach, uh, intestine, gallbladder. And if you look at those areas, you see that those are areas that have major activities going on, uh, digestion, absorption happening all over here. Um, they are majorly for protection, secretion, and absorption. All right. So again, if you look at this, this is the basement membrane. And here is it. Now, I, I remember I told you yesterday that whenever you see any epithelial tissue, you always see connective tissue below them because that's the cell that feed them. And so if you look at this now, here are connective tissues. And here are connective tissues, right? These are the tall and slender cells. Now, this is pseudostratified. So look at this very well with me. These cells are pseudostratified. If you look at it, you will see that. Please follow me carefully. Now, if you look at these cells now. Um, okay, cool. Now, if you look at this cell, you will see that this cell here, it appears to be different layers, but actually is not multiple layers. Number one thing that tells you it's not multiple layers is this, this is the apical surface, right? Apical surface. This is the basement membrane here. Number one is that if you check, all the cells are touching the basement membrane. And the same thing here, if you come here, all these cells are touching the basement membrane. The fact that all the cells are touching the basement membrane makes it to appear to be simple. Because for simple, uh, for simple, all the cells are touching the basement membrane. Number two, all the cells are not touching the apical surface. So that makes it also not to be Pseudo strat not to be stratified because for, strat for stratify, all the cells cannot be touching the apical surface and all the cells are not touching the basement membrane. So when you look at that, that's a confusing group. So we call it pseudo stratified. So look at this single cells, layer of cells with the appearance of multiple layer due to the varying position of the nucleus, the nuclei, all cells are connected to the basement membrane, that's key, at the abyssal surface. And not all cells are reaching the apical surface. So that makes them to be pseudo stratified. You see them in the lining of the trachea, nasal cavity, uh, male reproductive tract. That's where you see. That's where you see those cells all right let's go now stratified now if you look at this you can tell that these cells are not one layer of cells these are stratified cells this is the basement membrane these are connective tissues, and these cells are different layers. Now, how do you name cells that have different layers? You name cells that have different layers by looking at the cell at the apical surface. Now, if you look at this, you will look at, if you look at these cells that I'm drawing on, you will see that these cells look cuboidal. If you look at all of them here, you see that they all look cuboidal. But when you come to this top here, what shape does these cells here look like? 
Um, squamous. Very good. They look flat, so they are yes. squamous. So even though all the cells at the base look cuboidal, that is not going to be our concern. What is going to determine the name is the fact that number one, it is stratified, multiple layer, so it's stratified. Number two, it is squamous cells at the apical surface. The cells at the apical surface is what determines the name of the cell, not the cells at the basement membrane. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, great, great. All right, so when you are naming cells that are stratified, you consider the cells at the apical surface, just like if you want to tell that it's me here now, even if my wife decides to come with this same uh, sh shirt that I'm wearing and sit here, just by seeing the face, you can tell that this is not me. All right, so the face, the cells at the apical surface is what determines how to name the cells. Let's go. So look at this now. This is stratified cuboidal epithelium. The reason it's cuboidal is because number one is stratified because it has multiple layer. I'm coming on, but I will take your question. So if you look at this now, it's stratified because this is so this is what you are looking at. You are just focusing on one of these, just this. And if you're looking at this, how many layer is this? How many layer thick is this? Two. Two. It's two cell thick. Does that make sense? If you look at this now, this is another one we can focus on. How many cell thick is this? About how many layer cell how many cell layer thick is this? About two. So yeah. good. If you look at it from here, it could be like three. Yeah, or, three. Or it's majorly two. Yeah. If you look at this as well, you see that? So what we are looking at about stratified or not stratified is the number of layer of the cell. All right, that's what we are looking at about stratify or not stratify is the number of layers of the cell. So these cells are about two layer thick. It shows that it is stratified. Number two, what is the shape of the cell? That's the second thing. The cells don't look flat. They look more like cube in shape. Like I told you, cells are not, you don't expect it to have exactly the same measurement, length and breadth, but you just evaluate it. Does that make sense? And say, okay, does this look flat? No. Does it look cuboida? Does it look columnar? That's the way to go. Away. Go ahead, Amabala. Oh, sorry, I have two questions. Uh, number Please one, you ahead. said uh, the cell at the apical surface determine the name of the cell, not the basement. Is mm -hmm. it only for stratified or for all of them? Yeah, but stratified is the only one that have layers. No, no. So, okay, okay. okay. Does that make so, sense? Stratified is the only one that have layers. Simple don't have layer. You only have one layer of cells. So that means it's that cell that determine the name. You, you, there's no confusion about simple is not going to have different shape of cell because it's just one layer. Oh, yeah. Stratified is the one that have multiple layers. So that's the only way, only place we have that. Pseudo stratified is going to be one type of cell because it's not multiple layers anyway. So the only time you need to look at the cells at the apical surface is when you have stratified. Okay, thank you. Then secondly, when we are trying to know this thing, like this one we have here now, is it the those one inside that will take note of or the big one? Because it's so What do you mean? I don't understand. You know, inside this big one, we have this uh, small, small one that's like dark blue. Dark blue, okay. dark blue. Look at this. Look at this. Oh no, this okay, thank you for asking. I figured that's what you didn't get in the lab then. Mm -hmm. The one, the thing, the dark curved portion inside is the nucleus. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. The darker portion inside is the nucleus. So the entire thing, like this is a cell now. This is a cell. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. This dark portion inside is the nucleus of that cell. This okay. is a cell. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. This is a cell. The darker portion inside is the nucleus. 
So, right, so the one we are needing to, to for us to determine the no, the name is the cell, right? Is a cell. Cell is what tells you the name, not the nucleus. Of course, the nucleus can also help you to know because look at this now. Both of them, you can't really look at this. The cells are this apical surface now. If the nucleus, the cell is flat. If a cell is flat, the nucleus will also be flat. A cell cannot be flat and the nucleus will be cube. Does that make sense? Because if something is stretching like this, all right, so that's, so it's the same thing, but you just need to know which one is cell, which one, the dark thing is the nucleus, the entire thing is a cell. Like this now, this is a cell. This here is a cell. This is a cell. The dark portion inside is nucleus. This is a cell. The dark portion inside is nucleus. This is a cell. The dark thing you are seeing is nucleus, but the nucleus and the cell can never be confusing because like here, now you may not see detailed boundaries, but you can tell that this nucleus has flat or this nuclear flat. Does that make sense? All right. So looking at this, is that clear, Mabala? Yes, correct, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. You're welcome. So look at this. This is stratified columnar. Stratified columnar simply means it is multiple layer and it has appearance of a column, longer length, shorter breadth. Now, this kind of cell, this ear, so look at this. Don't be confused with this. Look at this ear. This is the basement membrane. Here is the basement membrane. And of course, these are connective tissues here. Connective tissues all over here. All right. So now, when you are looking at this, slide now think about this slide if you are looking at it this way even if it's this way this here is the basement membrane read this way is the basement membrane here is the basement membrane so the cells here are the cells at the base even though this slide is inverted right these are the cells at the base and then these cells are the cells at the top and they are columnar does that make sense you see, these cells are long. Now, the other version of this, this is the lumen, meaning that the hand opening. All right. And if you think about where you see this now, you see this in pharynx. So if you are thinking about this in the pharynx now, this here is what you see in salivary dots, salivary gland dots, meaning that is the middle. It's just like we, you are looking at a tube and you took pictures of the lining of the tube. That's the way this is. So this is the middle, the lumen. Lumen means the middle, right? The opening. Like it's just like you have these blood vessels. Let's say you have blood vessels. Here is the lumen. That's the lumen. And now you now took the picture. So this is the other side. This is normal orientation, straight way. Here is the connective tissue. Here is the basement membrane. These cells are the base. They are cuboidal cells. But the cells at the top are columnar. So we are going to call it stratified columnar epithelium. Does it make sense? Oh, oh, okay. So, okay. The reason, okay, because uh, is the epica that determines the name. Thank you. That's why we're calling it uh, um, stratified columnar. And not cuboidal, since cuboidal at the base. But, sir, at times this, I don't know, maybe it's only me. Mm -hmm. All this new um, shape, shape at times it will look like it's flat. <laughs> no, it depends nice on good. how you are looking at it. Look at this. This is not. Um, this is not flat. It, 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 look at this. This is what you like. This here now. This is what you are looking at here. Once you are able to identify the basement membrane, that is it. Excuse me. So this is this is these are connective tissues here. This is the basement membrane here. Here. Now these cells here are not flat because you have seen flat set before. The way to know it is to look at it over and over again. Now what do I tell you about flat cells? The length, the breadth will be long. The length will be shorter than the breadth. You are comparing it. So if you have a cell that have the length longer than the breadth. This is flat cell. This, 
can never be flat cells. This is cuboidal. This can never be flat cells. This is columnar. So for flat cells, the length, the breadth is longer than the length. For cuboidal, they are about the same length. But I told you, it's still not exactly like you are measuring with ruler and say they are equal. No, it's just that when you look at it, they look approximately the same. But when you look at the co columnar, the length is longer and it's obvious. And if you come here, these cells is obviously longer length than the breadth. So this is columnar. This cell is obviously longer length than the breadth. It's columnar. This cell is obviously about equal. This cell is about equal. This cell, I can't say this is columnar. This is about equal. It is clear that this is not columnar. And does it look flat? No, this is not flat because we already saw what flat looks like earlier. Now, if you come back here, we said this is flat. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So look at it over and over again. That will help. Now, this is pseudo stratified. Yes, I mean, so sorry, this is stratified transitional rather. Now, trans stratified transitional transitional means that's what you see in United Bladder. And if you look at this area, you see that this cell here is at this point, you see that the appearance is different. But the moment when you when the bladder is full, so you see the cells are different here. The moment when the bladder is full, it will stretch out. So now it's stretched like this. These cells now stretch like this. These cells are stretched now. So at this point, we say that it has changed. And the reason it's changed is just because the bladder became full. So we say this is transitional. Now, you may wonder, how do you know? How will you know? If I need you to identify it or discuss it on the exam, I will also give you a picture that will tell you. Either I'm giving you both pictures or you are seeing it in a way that you can obviously tell. So don't be worried about that, okay? All right. Key thing I need you to know is that the kind of cells that changes shape is called transitional, and you can see it in urinary bladder. Now, um, glandular epithelium, the epithelium that are glands. I want to be a bit fast now so that I can have time to point to a few things about the exam. Epithelium that are glands. Uh, we have the exocrine gland and endocrine gland and put it straight in your note. Endocrine gland are the glands that, now, endo means it is inside. I'm starting with that. Endo means it is inside, right? Endo means inside. Exo means outside. So a gland that makes its secretion to the outside of your body directly by itself is the exocrine. So exocrine makes secretion directly to the outside environment. Which gland do you think makes secretion and releases secretion to the outside of your body? Can you think about glands that does that? Sweat. I don't know. Thank you. Sure. Sweat glands. Um, yeah, Chris, gonad will not be part of that. Think about gonad as, um, think about the testes. Testes cannot um, secrete testosterone outside. Even though the testes is outside, it makes its secretion inside the body. It does not bring it out. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Okay. I got you, Chris. There is, uh, okay. Uh, I was trying to look at the other angle for that. Um, yeah, maybe that could be, uh, all right. Let me come back to that if I have to, but if you look at the, uh, gland, you think about your sweat gland. When you sweat, it comes outside. When you 
um, uh, if you think about it, there, there is a gland. For some of us, you know, even if you don't use lotion, particularly this summer now, by the time you get out, what's going to happen to your face? It's going to be oil all over, right? For some of us, it's like that. You will notice that oil is just everywhere. That is sebaceous gland. That oil, that gland secretes what we call sebum. It's sebaceous gland. Um, salivary gland as well. Salivary gland makes secretion by itself outside. I will explain the outside so that that will help. Uh, pseudoferous gland, which is sweat gland, also does that. Now, um, but when you look at um, when you look at pituitary gland, for instance, now, and we say that um, pituitary gland makes insulin. Now, the insulin that um, Insulin that um, spiritual gland mix is going to go into the blood, and from the blood, is going to circulate to where it should go. Now, so you don't, it doesn't go outside of the body. Hormones that are secreted. So that is where uh, what um, Chris said come into place, which is correct. I wasn't thinking like that earlier is gonad have both endocrine and exocrine function uh, but any gland that's making secretion into the blood is what we call a uh, endocrine gland they make their secretion into the blood so because of that they are able to the blood circulate their secretion but blood does not circulate your sweat blood does not circulate your saliva blood does not circulate your urine uh, and when you think about the gonad, for instance, as well, blood does not have to circulate sperm. So that's where what gonad, uh, Chris said had come into place as well. There are not some secretions, any secretion that is not made into the blood. The gland that makes it is an exocrine gland because they make their secretion and it exits the body. Thank you. All right, let's go. Now, I will, I will skip this. You can read this. You can read this yourself. That will help me to be able to capture a few things. Now, um, okay, cool. So there is structural classification of exocrine gland, and then there's functional classification. Now, the structural classification just tells you about how they are classified based on the appearance. And then we have different structures that they have. Usually I'll just describe this structure here so you can read the structures there. Um, but functional classification is what I think I should talk about particularly. Now, there are three kinds of exocrine gland based on the function that they do. Now, there is based on the structure and based on the function. Based on the function, we have three types. The first type, I will start by talking about it from the last one. The, the, the holocrime is the first one I will talk about. Holocrime. And you know, when I think about this holocrime, I first think about it as all, all, all crime. Now, you know what is interesting about it? You know, we already said that exocrine glands are glands that they make their secretion and they release their secretion to the outside by themselves. They don't need to put it into the blood for blood to circulate. They send it out by themselves. And we said salivary gland is there. Gonads have exocrine fluxion as well. Uh, sweat gland is there. They make their secretion to the outside of the body. Sebaceous gland, right? Um, now, so the holocrine, when it's making its secretion, it makes its secretion, and then the, the gland itself also rupture along with the secretion. So it's not that it's just releasing the secretion. The whole of the gland is going to rupture, the whole. And that's why I think about it as whole, 
holocrine. Mm -hmm. So the all of the ground is going to rupture alongside with the with the old secretion. So that makes that kind of secretion not to be clear because there is is not just the secretion is also including some parts of the gland so that kind of secretion we of course have likely odor because it is not the secretion alone it also includes part of the gland so that's what you see in sebaceous gland you see this also in uh, the glands that you see around the handpit, and that's why you notice that such area may have uh, some more odor than what you see normally in the in sweat gland. Apocrine gland, you see it. That's what you see in mammary gland. And the word apocrine, I joke with it and say part, just it's just part. So I say this is all. I say this is just part. So the gland accumulate their product at the hypocrite surface, and then they will release part of their gland. The part of the cell will be released. So it's not also as clear. Part of it also released. Now you notice that the secretion that comes from the handpiece smells more than the secretion that comes from the, uh, oh, should I use that? Now, the, think about how palsy the secretion that comes on your sebaceous gland looks like how holy they look like that would be the best way to just stay on the holocrine then the hypocrine is the one that you see on the mammary gland and you know that it's still not as clear like liquid liquid it's because part of the gland is released with the secretion the last one that is clear is the meroclime, and you can see that in the texture of the salivary gland. All right, let's go. All right. Uh, okay, I'm looking at my time. So if you look at this, we have different types of uh, different classification of connective tissues. So we are looking at connective tissues now. Connective tissues, we have connective tissue proper, supportive, and fluid. Of course, the fluid is blood, and um, you have the blood and lymph on the fluid. Uh, the proper, we have the areola. We have areola connective tissue, which is loose. We have adipose, we have reticular. Then the dense, we have regular, we have irregular. Now, the supportive, we have cartilage and bone. Cartilage have three types. It has the hyaline cartilage, fibro cartilage, and the elastic cartilage. Let's go so that I can talk about some of them. Now, contrary to what we saw in epithelia, uh, cartilage, connective tissue, they have blood vessels. So because of that, they have resources right they have nutrients uh, they do protection they help with support transportation immunity and they do energy storage uh, blood formation happens there all right so they are abundant in the body they are not seen on the surface you don't see bone on the surface you don't see cartilage on the surface they are in the depth in the deeper area of the body typically they are vascularized uh, except for cartilage and dense connective tissue. Those are things to take note. They are also supplied with nerves. They have cells that are scattered around them. Let's go. Now, this is what you see in connective tissue, different things there. This here is, um, are the fibers. So you see the fibers here. Um, all right, so this here, is collagen all right so you see collagen fibers all right those are collagen fibers collagen fiber is what i'm tracing uh the very tiny one that looks tiny and firm is elastic fiber all right let's go i'll point to some of them as we go 
So connective tissues, anytime you see mature cells, you see blast. So you see chondroblast means immature cartilage cells. Uh, osteoblast means immature bone cells. But the mature form will be the one that have sites. So chondrocyte means mature bone cell. I mean mature cartilage cell. So this is immature cartilage cell. This is mature cartilage cell. This is immature bone cell. This is mature bone cells. So that's the way you see them generally. Now, key thing I want to tell you is all cells that are that are connective tissues, they actually begin from mesenchymal cells. So mesenchymal cell is the is the cell that gives rise to all of connective tissue cells. All right. Uh, let's go and look at this. Now, um, there is something we call extracellular matrix. The matrix is made up of fibers and grand substance. So be with me now. You will see what the matrix means later. I'm trying to be a little fast, but I will show it to you. Now, matrix is made up of fiber and grand substance. So keep that somewhere in your notes. Now, fibers is made up of three types. There's collagen fiber, reticular fiber, and elastic fiber. Now, the collagen fiber is a protein and it is resilient. Uh, that is actually part of what makes bone to be resilient, makes uh, some of these structures to be resilient, collagen fiber. Um, now, you notice that if you ever notice, you notice that tendon is actually tougher than beef. I don't know if you ever notice tendon when you eat meat. Tendon is the one is the part that look like white. That uh, most of the time, if you happen to see it when you are eating meat, you really can't do a cross sectional cut when you are eating it. You have to pull out the strand. That the way you are eating it is even to pull out the strand, and not to cut it, do a cross sectional cut. If you can relate to what I'm saying, so we call that tendon. Now, tendon and ligament, they are very tough. And the reason they are tough is because they are made up of collagen fiber. All right, so collagen fiber is quite tough. We have reticular fiber, which are made up of a kind of thinner and not as strong as collagen fiber. It's also collagen proteins that makes them up, but they are not as strong as what you see in collagen fiber. The elastic is made up of elastin. Those are key things you need to know about them. They are able to recoil and come back because they are elastic. All right. Now, grand substance, they are present between, if you remember, I told you matrix is made up of fiber and grand substance. I've talked about the fiber. Now, the grand substance, they are found between cells and fibers. So it's like a sandwich environment, like sandwich. So you have cell, you have fiber, then you have the grand substance. Now, the key thing is the grand sub sub fibers are majorly substance, rather, they are made up of water and some polysaccharide and protein. So water, carbohydrate, and proteins. All right, let's go. Now, every connective tissues, you see embryonic, you see mature. Embryonic, I told you all connective tissues. Don't forget this slide. I told you all connective tissues develop from mesenchymal cells. You see that? All connective tissue, car uh, cartilage, bone, tendon, ligament, all connective tissues develop from mesenchymal cells. And I'll show it to you in a bit. So if you, in embryo, you are going to see mesenchymal cells there. They are present in embryo and fetus, but they are there as mesenchymal cells. In adult, they are going to be there as loose connective tissue, which you see in adipose, areola, those are loose connective tissue. Adipose is majorly what we call fats. All right. Areola tissue is part of the tissue around the breast. All right. So you see that they are loose. A dense connective tissue is another kind of tissue. Those are tough. All right. Then you have bone, you have um, cartilage, you have liquid, which is where you see blood and lymph nodes. All right. So 
looking at this, this is what you see in the embryo, and I told you it's majorly mesenchymal cells. So you see mesenchymal cells everywhere. So if you're analyzing the connective tissue of an embryo now, all you're going to see there are mesenchymal cells because that's the precursor for cartilage, that's the precursor for bone, that's the precursor for tendon uh, ligament. All right, so areolar connective tissue is everywhere. The rule is this, anywhere you see areola, you're going to see adipose, mostly. Uh, they contain fibroblasts, adipocytes, you see that? Areola contain adipocytes. Adipocytes are the cells of adipose tissue. All right, they contain macrophages, mast cells, uh, white blood cells, and plasma. Uh, they contain collagen, elastic, and reticular fiber as well. So those are the combinations you see there. Let's go. I'm running through now because of time, but I, I will ensure I touch the things you need. And I'll take some few minutes to talk about the exam as well. Adipose consists of adipocytes, of course, that store glyceride, they store fats. Don't forget, fat is part of, is a type of uh, fat, is glyceride that we looked at yesterday. Now, found where areola connective tissue is found. You see that? So you find adipose where you see areola. You find areola where you see adipose. When we said areola, we say you're going to see adipose side there, which is cell of the adipose. So that means adipose is there. Then we adipose as well, you see areola there. Adipose majorly is fat, so it stores energy, right? It also helps with insulation, protecting against heat loss because it's adipose. And it helps to pad organs, so it helps to protect organs as well. All right, so this is adipose, and those are fat vacuoles inside them. Reticular, that key, they provide support. You find them majorly in liver, kidney, spleen, lymph node, and bone marrow. They are major job is to provide support now dense irregular dense irregular look at dense irregular very well i will show you the other one very soon they are irregularly arranged so the difference between dense irregular and irregular which i'll be talking about soon dense irregular and dense regular the difference between them is that collagen fibers are here these collagen fibers here they are scattered all around they are scattered they don't have regular pattern that's why it's called dense irregular. The, ar the arrangement of the skeleton of the collagen fibers are not in order. So it's just like if something is scattered now, you can scatter it easily. But when something is making a bunch, it makes it difficult to break. That's what you see in tendon. If you, if you go, if you just Google, which I don't want to do now because of time, if you look at tendon, you will see what tendon looks like in meat tendon in meat you just see what it looks like it's difficult to break to cut just because of the arrangement of the collagen fiber the way they are arranged and if you look at it if you touch if you are touching the the rear side of your of your leg now um if you if you are touching the back of your leg now you will notice that there's tendon right there the tendon there it's very tough. Let me see if I can do this. Now, what you see here is tendon. You notice that that, that is very tough. That's, a ten, that's tendon there. Now, uh, and the reason it's tough is because of the arrangement of the collagen fiber. The collagen fiber in irregular is not as tough because it's not well arranged. You see it under the skin. This is part of the reason that our skin wrinkles as we age, because these dense irregular connective tissue start to lose their strength. They start to weaken and the skin now begin to wrinkle as we age. Now this is the dense regular, which you see in tendon and ligament, and that's why they are tough. So you see how they are arranged in pattern. You see the organization, that's the difference, all right? So I'm going. All right, mature connective tissues, bone. So I'll just be fast now. Key thing that I want you to take note, particularly here, you see bone, the functional unit of bone is called osteon. Functional unit of bone is called osteon, and you can see osteon there. This is a functional unit of bone. Here is the entire osteon. This is an osteon. All right, this is an osteon. 
This osteon is a functional unit of bone, just like cell is a functional unit of life. Now, in the middle of the osteon, you have something, so it looks like cell, but it's not a cell, it's just a functional unit of bone, it's called osteon. In the middle, you have something that we call the central canal. Central canal is also the same thing as avesian canal. I'm saying this just in case on the exam, you see avesian canal instead of central canal, you're wondering what is it? Avesian canal, is the same thing as central canal, all right? Is the same as central canal. Um, um, Avesian system is also the same as ostean. So I can say Avesian system and I can say ostean is the same thing. All right, so Avesian system is the ostean. Avesian canal is the central canal. Inside this Avesian canal, if you notice now, you notice that we have blood vessels there. So there are three things inside the Avesian canal. There's the blood vessels, there's the, uh, there's blood vessel, there's blood vessel, right? Artery and vein, and there's nerve. Those are the three things there. Artery, vein, and nerve inside the central canal. Artery, vein, and nerve. Now, if you look at this, I'm explaining a lot of things here, so I will skip the slide since I'm talking about it here now. Now, so if you come here, you see these are central, this is the central canal. Now you notice these dark spots, these dark spots. All these dark spots, we call it trab, we call it lacune containing osteocytes so the black spot is like a covering there is a cell inside and then there is a covering covering the cell what is covering the cell is called lacune and the cell is called osteocyte i just think about it as you know this 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 um this peanut that is usually in shell that you have to crack the shell before you bring out the coat so the peanuts that's the way osteocyte is. Osteocyte is the peanut. The peanut is osteocyte inside the shell. That's the peanut. The peanut is osteocyte uh, inside the shell. So the shell is called lacune, and the osteocyte is the peanut. So we call it osteocyte inside lacune. And don't forget, mature blood, cell, mature bone cell is osteocyte. Now look at this with me. So each of these, you see, these are osteocyte inside lacune, osteocyte inside lacune, osteocyte inside lacune. Now, but if you look at this carefully, let me show it to you here. Again, these are osteocyte inside lacune. Please, are you still with me? I just want to know. Just let me know on the yes. chat. Or okay, great. Thank you. Any other person stay with me? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Great. Now, you see all of these are osteos uh, osteocyte inside lacune, osteocyte inside lacune. But you will take note of something. Now, if we say, great, thank you. This is the central canal. Here is the central canal. Inside the central canal, we have blood vessel, we have artery vein and nerves. Now that tells you that nutrient is going to be flowing from here because that's where the arteries, vein and nerves are, right? So nutrient comes from here. So how will this nutrient be circulated and reach the cells? Because the cells need nutrients, all right? So you see this here, you see these lines here, you see this line here, all this line, you will notice that they all connect to the lacune and they all, they are coming from the central canal. So you see, it's connecting every of them together. Those are called canaliculi. So the canaliculi, take note of that, the canaliculi connects the osteocyte to the uh, central canal. It's connected the lacune or the osteocyte to the central canal. All right, that is it. Now, 
there is something here that is not labeled there, but I'll show you. Now, if you take note that the way they are arranged, everything looks like a circle. It looks like ring. That's the best word to use. So you see, everything looks like ring. Everything looks like ring all around, even though they are they may not be too much organized, but they all look like ring. Now, each ring is called lamella. Each ring is called lamella. All right. Each ring is called lamella. If it's single, I think it will have E. Each ring is called lamella. All right. Let me go. Since you can still watch the video again, I don't need to go back again. Let me just go for time's sake. So I've talked about everything here. Compact bone is a uh, functional unit of compact. I mean, osteon is a functional unit of compact bone. I've talked about that already. All right, let's go. Now, cartilage are three types. So follow me quickly. I'll talk about this quickly because of time. There are three types of cartilage. There is um, our link cartilage, fibro cartilage, and uh, elastic cartilage. Fibro cartilage means that it has fiber, fibro cartilage. So fibro cartilage, you see it because it has fiber, it's tough. So you see it in weight bearing areas. So you're going to see fibro cartilage between the vertebral bone at the back. So fibro cartilage is between the vertebral bone. Fibro cartilage is between your nails. Fibro cartilage is between your nail. Allen cartilage is there as well. So don't be confused. It's also allen cartilage is also at your nails, but fibro cartilage is there. Then fibro cartilage is also at the pubic symphysis between your pubic bones. So those are where that's where you see them. All right, let's go. All right, so this tells you all I've said and where you can find them. So let's go. Um, yeah, I think I'll just go read that up. I, I know I discussed all of them on the video on YouTube, but I just want to point to a few things before I close this and quickly talk about the test. Uh, blood, yeah, just read this. Let me go read this. All right, for muscles, we have three types of muscles. We have the cardiac muscles, skeletal muscles, and smooth muscles. Cardiac, you see it around the heart. Skeletal, all over the body. Smooth, in the lining of olo organs. You see it around the heart, the lungs, the blood vessels, artery vein, around the stomach. You see smooth muscles all over there. Key thing is this, their control. That's the key thing I need you to always remember. Your skeletal muscles, you move it by yourself. Now I'm deciding when I'm moving my hand, all right? My arm, rather. I'm moving my arm now, I can decide it. Talking is, is skeletal muscles. I decide when I talk. So I don't just run my mouth and say it's a mistake. I don't just eat people and say it's a mistake because I decided to do it. It's voluntary actions. Anything that is voluntary action is controlled by somatic nervous system. So I will take note of that here real quick. I think I'll be rounding off now and go talk about the test. So this guy is controlled by somatic nervous system. Somatic nervous system controls this guy. So that tells you that its, its activity is voluntary because it's somatic nervous system. Now, this guy, these two are controlled by, I call it automatic, but it's not automatic actually, it's autonomic. Aut I see there, sir. It's Mike.
Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. I mean, I, I just. Yes. Okay. But did I go off? Yes, you went off. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I think it was my, it's my headphone. I don't know what's happening. It's not showing me anything that the battery is down, but I just knew I couldn't hear anything from your hand. All right. So if you look at this, I'm sorry about that. Autonomic is autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system control these guys. Autonomic nervous system. So because they are controlled by autonomic nervous system, they are involuntary. So that tells you something. Anything controlled by the autonomic nervous system will be involuntarily controlled, meaning that you don't decide it. You don't decide when you breathe. You don't decide when your heart breathes. You don't decide when your when your lung pump blood. You don't say, okay, I want my heart to pump blood. Now you don't say, I want my blood vessels to pump blood now. You don't say that. You don't decide it. You can't decide the degree. That is autonomic. All right. Now, these guys, okay, let me go. All right. So, this is skeletal. Key thing I want to tell you here the reason I came to this image is that you see some striation on there. Just take note that skeletal muscles have striations. The striation simply means the proteins are arranged in a way that gives it pattern. It's simple. Just look at it. This shirt I'm wearing now does not have pattern because the part the shirt makes is not it doesn't show like a rigid pattern, but actually it has pattern on it because of the arrangement of the fab fabrics. But there are some shirts you see that are plain. That is what we are talking about. So the arrangement of the protein that are responsible for contraction makes it to have pattern so it has pattern on it so we call it striation the same pattern is also on um on on cardiac but there's no pattern on smooth all right so let's go the last one i will talk about quickly is the okay yeah so it's just like two slides to talk about that then i'll talk about the exam is the nervous tissue uh let me see All right. Now, sorry, before I go, there is something that separates skeletal tissues, I mean, cardiac tissues, cardiac cells. If you remember, I told you about cells joined together yesterday to form tissues. And when cells are joined together, that means there has to be cell junction that connect them together. And the cell junction can be tight junction, gap junction, and desmosome. Between cardiac cells, there is something that we call intercalated disc. Don't forget that, that join them together. And here is it. The intercalated disc join, it's in between cardiac cells. And we say that is a kind of desmosome and gap junction as well. Of course, I told you yesterday that cardiac muscles allow, uh, they allow movement of, um, they allow movement of, I mean, they do action potential. So that means there will be gap junction in between the cells, allowing neurotransmitters to pass through them. All right. So here is what we call this uh, intercalated disc. Here is intercalated disc. Here is intercalated disc. They divide the cell from each other. So one intercalated disc to another intercalated disc make a cell. All right. So that is, this is intercalated disc. This is intercalated disc. Don't forget that, please. All right, let's go. All right, nervous system, you, there are key two things. It has neuron and neuroglia cells. The neuron is the major guy that does the process. The neuroglia cells only support. The neuron have three body parts. It has the part that we call the exon. It has a part that we call the dendrite, and it has a part that we call the cell body. So this is the exon. The exon, what the exon does is to transport a uh, decision of the brain to the organ that would take the action. So you see, it takes nerve processes that conduct, it's nerve processes that conduct away, that conduct information away from the body. From the cell body so it takes information away dendrite these are dendrites 
they bring information into. And this is the cell body where the information will be processed. I'll take it again. Dendrites, another word for dendrites are receiver. They are the ones that receive information and bring it into the cell body. The cell body process the information. The agent then take the information and away to the organ or to another neuron that will process it. That's that. Let's go. Neuroglia cells, those are neuroglia cells. I think I'll be talking more about that later. All right. So I'll stop there and I'll go ahead and talk about the test now. Is that okay? All right. Um, I'm still recording. Let me see. I have chapter three. Do I have chapter three here? Again, thank you. I'll take a few minutes to talk about the test now. Um, All right. All right, I'm with you. I just want to pull something up. So as me your quizzes, um, I know I've gotten a feedback about one of the quiz questions, but is there any one that want to say anything about the quiz? Is there anything that you want to bring to my attention? Okay. All right. So let me go ahead. Just like, it has a lot of diagrams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you enjoy the diagrams? No. Ah, why? <laughs> it's just it's a lot. It's a lot. You don't like diagrams? Yeah. Uh, sometimes diagrams are better to learn than because you have to you can see. like you have to just put everything there, you know. Omobala, if you see me tomorrow, are you going to know it's me? Of course. <laughs> but if I write some things for you now about me and I ask you to read it, if you see me tomorrow, are you going to likely remember everything I wrote for you? I know. I okay. I know we are all different anyway, but then diagram is a very good way to learn. Oh, no. Most of the time, it stresses us out because of our mind, not because it's not easy to learn. And then maybe also because of the frame, the time frame of the class, you know? Of course. Yeah, <laughs> that's part of what you have to. Now, it has advantage, like I told you on the first day of class. The advantage is that you are doing it every day. That helps you. This is yeah. first week, so mm -hmm. it's okay. You'll be fine. Don't worry. Thank you, sir. Um... All right, so let's go. I'm still recording it, so I'll be able to make it available to everyone that is not here. Um, so um, take note of this. Uh, make sure, so I will, on the exam, there will be multiple choice. Then there will be matching questions, okay? The, the matching, uh, so generally, 
you want to take note of the systems. You know, I talked about the, uh, should I share my screen and talk about the PowerPoint? That will help if I'm pointing on to it on the PowerPoint. Okay. Yes. Let's try that. Let's try. Let's try. Let me be careful that I don't mistakenly share the question, the test. Um, so I should be on chapter one now, right? So let me put chapter one. I think this chapter one, yeah. Which which screen are you seeing? Are you seeing the screen that have PowerPoint or the screen that have test? PowerPoint. Well, we hope to see the one with test. PowerPoint. To introduction see? to human anatomy. Okay. You want to see the one that have test too? Okay. So let's go. Let's see the one you are seeing for. So, uh, take note of systems. I won't go in any other. So, take note of systems. Um, so this is. Um, so these system, um, these systems take note of what they do and the organs, I mean, and the organs that make them up. Does that make sense? Respond to me. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So take note of the system and the organs that make them up. That's the first thing I'll tell you. So like, if I'm doing like matching, I could match them and put the functions there and the organ, I mean, and the system. So you should be able to match them with the organs that they have. I mean, with the functions that they do, uh, like that, like that. So take note of that. That's one thing I'll tell you first. The other is, you see these guys here? This, take note of them as well. I could match them as well. And you will need to tell me the way they uh, are related, like the meaning of each of them. Does that make sense? So like metabolism now, meaning that it's chemical reactions, right? Um, responsiveness, respond, uh, stimuli, you should be able to take note of that as well. Now, chapter one, you remember I talked about I really didn't, didn't, didn't talk about it proper, but I asked you to watch the video, uh, but I taught it to people in my lab, but I remember I asked you to watch the video and it's on the video. So these, these, these directions, take note of them, be able to know what it means that you say something is superior to something. So like, like I ask you now, your high is superior, your high is superior to your chin, right? Does that make sense? Your high is superior to your nose, right? Uh, your nose is superior to your mouth, things like that. Um, your buttocks is posterior, uh, so things like that. This, this, this thumb, this thumb, is it, is it, is it lateral or medial? Is it lateral or medially located? Your Which thumb. One? Which one, sir? Your thumb. It's lateral. Thank you. It's lateral, so you should know things like that. Your pinky is medially located. Your tongue is la your thumb is laterally located. Um, your skin is it superficial or deep? Things like that. Your skin is superficial, right? Yes, yeah, superficial. All right. Um, so you should know that. Oh, good. Let me tell you this. So if you look at your right foot and your your right foot, your right foot, or let me use my hand. Your right hand and your left hand. Is it ipsilateral or contralateral? It's contra. It's contralateral. I'm again contra. <laughs> you give contra. <laughs> Why Please, you give contra? Can you explain that? This is my first time of hearing contra. You I didn't watch the lecture video I asked you to watch. <laughs> I know lateral, but that contra, I have not heard it before. So contralateral means it's in different direction. 
ipsilateral means it is in opposite side. I mean, if ipsilateral means it is in the same side, contralateral means it is opposite side. So this is it. Your, your right arm, I mean your right arm and your and your right leg is ipsilateral. Your left and left leg or left lower limb is ipsilateral. But this and this are contralateral because they are on different side. So you, you are correct. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, sir. So that's correct. So you guys got it right. It's contralateral, contra, contrary. They are contrary to each other. They are not on the same side. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, so that's that. So take note of things like that. You remember sagittal plane, right? Sagittal is this. If it is mid sagittal, it means in the, is in the middle. It's cut from the middle. All right. Um, So cavities, make sure you go and review cavities very well again. Cranial cavity, what is in the cranial cavity? I think it's the brain, right? Is it a dorsal or ventral cavity? Dorsal. Am I right? Thank you. You're right. Okay. Dorsal mean posterior, right? Yeah, at the back. Yeah, so it's dorsal. Um, vertebral canal, is it dorsal or ventral? Dorsal. It's also dorsal. That's what contains your spinal cord. Thoracic, what, what are the cavities inside thoracic cavity? Chest. Oh, chest. My, my, no. my dance uh, Chest is not cavity. This is what I'm talking about. Inside the thoracic cavity, you have the pleural yeah, cavity. Yeah. Your pleura is your heart, is your yeah, lungs. lungs. So you have pleural cavity. You have mm -hmm. mediastinum, mediastinum, which consists of the pericardial cavity. So this is what we're about. So this is it. You see that? This is the pericardial cavity that consists of the heart. This is the pleural cavity on one side and the pleural cavity. So that's what you have in the thoracic cavity. Um, and mediastinum, right? Abdominal cavity. What do you have in the abdominal cavity? What are the organs that are there? The stomach, um, baby. Good. Yeah, you're yeah, correct. Continue. What other organ? Intestine. Okay. Intestine. So is it okay to just say digestive system is there? Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Pelvic cavity. What do you have in the pelvic cavity? <sighs> system. Good, thank you. What else? Reproductive system. Mm -hmm. Appendix. Yes, so a little part of the digestive system, thank you for mentioning that, Chris. A little part of the digestive system swing into the pelvic system as well. Does that make sense? So that's why we call it, that's why we usually use abdominal pelvic cavity. Does that make sense? Because some uh, they are connected together. All right, so that's that. Um, let me see other things I still want to point to you there. Do your quizzes very well. Your quizzes will help you. Like I said, you won't see the questions. It's not like there's no way I will escape it that you won't see one of two questions from your quizzes, of course. But it's not like the questions on the quizzes are on the test. Um, but it will help you. So take note of... Um, um, what tissues are, of course, you know what tissues are already. Uh, you know what tissues uh, consist. Uh, excuse me. Okay, you already know that um, you know negative feedback, right? So most of the most of the activities in our body is negative feedback, right? What is histology? Study of cells. No. no. Study of tissue. Study of tissue. Cytology is study of cells. You remember? What is biopsy? What did you call before, sir? Histology. Histology. Oh, histo. Oh, no cyto. Oh, sorry. What is biopsy? 
Um, sample tissue. When you take from a living, when you take something for Very a sample. Good. When you need to analyze the tissue of a living person, that's study, that's biopsy. When you need to study the tissue of the dead to know the cause of the death, that is autopsy. 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 You can't forget autopsy, right? So when you see biopsy, you know that's the opposite, right? Um, let me see anything I just want to talk about. Can you give me an example of pos of negative feedback and an example of positive feedback, real quick? Uh, positive uh, when you want to give birth. Okay, uh, somebody uh, else give me negative. Thank you. Negative. Temperature. Say it again. Temperature, body temperature. Yeah, body temperature goes up, the body brings it down, right? That's blood sugar goes up, body brings it down. Pleura membrane. Pleura and viscera. What's the difference between pleura and viscera serous membrane? Uh, viscera is inside. Thank you. Viscera membrane is the one that covers the organ itself. And that's what you see here, right? Viscera membrane is the one that covers the organ itself. The pleura, so it's right here. Viscera membrane. Um, I thought I have it here. Let me highlight. Oh, this will not let me do that. Okay. So if you come here now, you see that this is this organ. Sorry, um, won't be able to go now. Okay, now if you come here, you see this organ here. The, the, the membrane that cover the heart itself is called visceral membrane or visceral pericardium when it comes to the heart. The, the, the layer that is away from the heart is called perieta. So perieta is away, viscera is the one immediately there on the uh, and don't forget, the reason it's called viscera is because any organ inside cavity, what do we call it? Viscera organ. Does that make sense? Any organ inside the cavity is a viscera. So your brain is a viscera. Spinal cord is a viscera. The heart is a viscera. The lungs is a viscera. Is a vis uh, their lungs are viscera. Digestive systems, they are viscera. Any organ, digestive organs rather, any organs inside cavity, we call them viscera. So the membrane that cover those organs directly is called visceral membrane. The one that that is a little way away from them that lines the bone is called pericard uh, is called perieta. And because this is around the heart, it's called viscera pericardium. Does that make sense? So if it's around the lungs, what do we call it? Visceral what? The viscera covering the lung. What are we going to call that viscera? Pleura. Thank you. Viscera pleura. Serous membrane or viscera pleura, right? The membrane that covers the lung is going to call viscera pleura. You see, we call this peritoneal area. So that means the viscera covering them will be viscera peritoneal. Uh, it's just to differentiate like that, if you see. So viscera pleura is the one that covers the heart, the lungs, all right? So you should, don't forget, you should know those planes, uh, par, uh, transverse, I mean, parasagittal. Parasagittal means, what's different between parasagittal and um, and um, mid sagittal? What's uh, different between parasagittal uh, and mid sagittal? Mid is equal, as in when you divide left and right is equal. Thank the you. Para is not equal. It can still be divided into two. Very Left good. So right. mid divide into two equal right and left. Para divide into two on equal right and left. So this is what it means. This is parasagita now. Look at me. A cut that cuts into equal right and left. Para mid sagita, mid sagita, equal right and left. The nostril is going to be one on right, one on left. Everything is going to be equal. That's mid sagittal. So, but if there's a cut like this, is this equal? No, that is para. It's still sagittal, 
is para sagita, but not if all right and left. All right, so take note of that. Uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm taking more time now. If you need to go by any chance you can, I will record it and then upload it for you to be able to see. Uh, homeostasis, of course, you know what homeostasis is already. Uh, those are a few things I think you should take note of. Take note of the cavities, the organ in the cavities. Uh, those are key. Um, yeah, I think those are the things I need you for chapter one. Okay, these guys, take note of this guy here. This, make it your friend. Take note of it. Um, I already told you the positions, how you should know what is superior mean. You need to understand that very well. What does it mean for something to be ventral, dorsal, and uh, cephal, caudal? So go ahead and look at those positions very well. Positions, directional terms, ipsilateral, quadrilateral, I mean, ipsilateral, contralateral. Take note of that very well. Um, all right, that's chapter one. I'll be fast with other ones. So for chapter two, let me see if there is chapter two. Uh, I don't even know if I should say something about chapter two now, since we discussed it very well, but I will briefly. So chapter two, of course, I can also have matching questions. Uh, you should know what non-polar non covalent bond is, right? You should know what uh, covalent bonds, hydrogen bond, ionic bond, polar covalent bond, you should know what those mean by default. You should be able to link them. If I'm asking, I could bring them. Um, I could ask you to describe something about RNA, DNA, ATP, uh, and tell me what is free radicals. I'm not sure if I mentioned that to you earlier. What are, what do you know? What free radicals are? Does anybody know free radicals? I just know they said they, they cause cancer. Thank you. <laughs> Why did they cause cancer? Uh, because it just starts breaking, breaking everywhere. Multiplying, multiplying. Uh, that's the effect on the cancer. So what, free radicals are these. Now, um, first is this. You, you know what aeons are, right? What are aeons? What are haeons? Do you know what haeons? I talked about haeons in chapter two. Is it the one you say you have cation and... Thank you. Uh, cation and hard ions, right? So haeons are simply charged molecules, right? They are charged molecules. They are molecules that are non-neutral. And when they are non-neutral, what makes them not to be neutral is because they have most likely lost an electron. They have an, they are not balanced. They are not stable, right? Now, when they... When... So when anything, when any element, TZ, these are free radicals actually. I like now oxygen is good in our system, right? But oxygen, when they lose electron, they become unstable. Oxygen molecule, you know what we breathe in oxygen molecule is good. But when oxygen now lose electron, let's say, think about it as somebody stole an electron from oxygen. Oxygen is now unstable then oxygen is now going to be looking for how to become stable by looking for an electron to replace the one that somebody took from it. Now, in the course of that, oxygen now becomes violent. So that's why they call them free radicals. They lose control. They go all around the body looking for replacement. So they don't care anywhere they are going to get that, that electron. If it's going to come out of your cell, they don't mind. If they're going to get it from your nucleus, they don't mind. If they're going to get it from your DNA, they don't mind. Anywhere they get it, they don't care. They just want to get it replaced. It's just like someone that something was stolen from and is now going to get it from anyone as well. Regardless of who that person is, it doesn't care if it's going to hurt anyone. Those are what we call free radicals in our system. So if they get those, if they get the element from a cell, 
they can cause the cell to now lose its normal functioning, then the cell begins to grow without control. That's why it can cause cancer. If it happens and it goes on your DNA, then it can cause the DNA to be mutated and that will affect protein that will be produced, cause another problem. So that's what we call free radicals. So they are usually charged atoms with unpaired electrons in their outermost shell. Those are free radicals. They are charged atoms with unpaired electrons in their outermost shell. Again, free radicals are charged atoms with unpaired electrons in their outermost shell. Go ahead, Um, uh, sir. So what can cause that thing to lose electron? <laughs> Anything can cause it. It is the, the the fact that it will happen in our body is unpredictable. The only thing is this: our lifestyle is what helps it. It happens. Stress causes it. Hmm. Um, like I said, if anybody needs to leave, it's okay. I will. I'm recording it. But if you are able to, that will be more helpful. I mean, I appreciate it. It helps. Now, um, stress causes it. Radiation causes it. Sun exposure causes it. Um, yeah, so stress causes it. So that's why it is advisable that you heat um, antioxidant, food rich in antioxidant. They help to capture or they help to um, the this or they help to um arm the anti the free radicals. So there is something that will they they bind to the free radicals and that helps to disarm to disarm them. So it's always good to eat food that are rich in antioxidants. That's what they deal with. Okay. Thank you, sir. So yeah, you're welcome. So, so they will happen. It will happen, but okay. our lifestyle can help to prevent the danger they can cause. Yeah, because you find out that some people they will say they have cancer. They don't smoke. They don't do. Yeah, sports. those things could happen. Sometimes it's also family history. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's also family history. Then food directly what we eat also hmm. cause a major part in that. Um, if you eat all this processed food over and over again, hmm. then we are causing hmm. we are opening ourselves up for that. Hmm. So know what acid is base, buffer, pH, salt, be able to describe them based on what I have there. Uh, what else do I want to point to here? Okay, I've talked about this. All right, let me talk about some few things more. Uh, please, sir, that definition you gave for a free radical, can you just take it one more time? It's simply atom with unpaired electron in its outermost shell. Atoms with unpaired electron in the outermost shell, free radicals. All right, let's go. So I've talked about, um, you know, isotopes. So take note of isotopes. Go back to your textbook. I want to reduce things I'm talking about now for time's sake. Uh, remember the monosaccharides. They are three types: fructose, glucose, galactose. Know how they meet, what they do. Uh, Carbohydrates, you store it as glycogen. So take note of that. Um, I think that would be the best way to be fast if I'm going through the PowerPoint, it won't help. Um, go back again and look at how we talk about atomic number, proton number. Um, yeah. If you remember, I talk about the four major elements that makes up the body. It is C H O N. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. nitrogen. Okay. Yeah, those are the four elements that makes up a ninety-six percent of our body weight. So you should take note of that. Don't go and review again how atom, electron are arranged, how we arrange the electron's configuration when we, I taught it. Valence number, how I describe that, go and look at it again. Uh, if an atom have three electrons, how many electrons will be, how is, how is the shell going to be arranged? How many electrons will be in the first shell? Two. Good. How many will be in the one outermost shell? All right. So what do we call the valence of that electron? Valence, valence. 
-hmm. what will be the valence of that electron? I mean, of that element. If it has two in its first shell, then one in its outermost shell, then what is the valence of that element? Hydrogen. Ion. No, what is this valence? Uh, Say? Electropositive? No. Is it covalent? No. No, its valence is one. Oh. Because it, the valence is the number of. Uh, the valence, so when we say valence, so take note of this. When we say what is the valence, we are looking at the number of unpaired electrons in the outermost shell. But when I just ask you what is the valence, what is the number, uh, how many electrons? So listen, let me explain this so that you get it well. I'll open the slide. Look at this. For this now, uh, let me use. Okay, good. Look at this. What is the valence of hydrogen here? Princess, are you with me? What is the valence of hydrogen here? Yes, I am. Thank you. What is the valence of hydrogen here? Are you talking about the name or the number? So the valence of hydrogen here, Jensi, you are with me, right? Good. The, the valence of hydrogen here is one. Why is it one? One is the, the number of electrons in its outermost shell, because it only has one shell, is the valence. So I will show you another one. Now look at lithium. This, uh, this shell, is what we call the valence shell. The valence shell is the outermost shell. So this shell is the valence shell. Take note of that now, okay? This shell is the valence shell. So how many electron is in the valence shell? One. 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 So if I ask you directly, how many electron is in the valence shell? The answer is one. Now, if we are talking about chlorine, for instance, now, that have 17 electrons, right? I'll tell you on the exam as well. I'll tell you the number of electrons there. How many electrons will be in the first shell for chlorine? The first shell, how many electrons will be there? Two. Thank you. How many electrons will be in the second shell? Eight. How many electrons will be in the last shell? Seven. Good. So this, this shell is the valence shell. Mm. The one outside. If I ask you now, listen, I can ask you two questions here again. Number one, I can ask you what is the number of how many electrons are in the valence shell? What will be the answer? Seven. In this, seven. Uh, seven. Seven. For if chlorine, I say, seven. If I say how many electrons will be in the valence shell, the answer is seven. Seven. But if I ask you, what is the valence of this element? The answer is one. Do you know why it's one? This is it. This is the reason it's one. I will draw the last shell alone. Just the last shell. I'm drawing the last shell. If I want to fill the electron, one, two, three, four. Oh, oops. I can't draw. It won't let me draw it. Two, five, six, seven, right? Now, how many electron is unpaired? You need one. 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 This is just the electron that is unpaired, right? Just this one. Yeah. Good. So listen to the question again. For chlorine now, the valence shell is this shell. This is the valence shell which you see here. It has seven electrons. If I just ask you, read questions very well. If I just ask you, how many electrons is in the valence shell? The answer is seven electrons are in the valence shell. Of course, it's seven. But if I ask you, what is the valence of this element? The answer is one. Because the valence 
is simply talking about the number of unpaired electron. Is that clear? Say that again. Yes. I will take it again. Number one, if I ask you, chlorine is seventeen two eight seven. Its valence electron, its valence shell is this. If I ask you, how many electrons are in the valence shell? The answer is seven electrons are in the valence shell because the valence shell is the outermost shell. Now, if I ask you, how many, what is the valence of this element? The answer is one. Valence is the number of unpaired electron in the outermost shell. So if you look at it, what is the valence of carbon? What is the valence of carbon? Valence of carbon. Think about it. No rush. Mm. How many is the valence of carbon? I can't remember. <laughs> Based on what we just did now, what is the what is the atomic number of carbon? That's the first thing to think about. Is it's it? okay if you don't know that, I will tell you. Carbon is number six. Okay. So how many electrons does it have? Six. It has six electrons. So how many electrons will be in the first shell? Two. How many electrons will be in the second shell? Four. Good. If it is four, what is how many electrons in the... Uh, now let me ask you, how many electrons are in the valence shell? Four. Thank you. What is the valence of carbon? Zero. No. Four. 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 Oh, okay. Because that last shell is going to have four. And by the time it has, it has four, one, don't forget you have to put in each hole. Oh, God. Oh, before you do. God. So one, three, four. So all the electrons are unpaired. So valence is the number of unpaired electron in the heart motion. Does that make sense? Uh, but sir, why are they not why are they unpaired? Yeah, remember you have to way. single, you have to feel single first people. If you remember, I explained it the other day. You have to see you have to put one in each pole before you double. You can't oh. just if you put them all together. At one time, you are going to cause a problem for yourself. You, you cannot to... just put them like two, two. If you do that, it will, it will, it will affect you when you are answering questions because you won't know hmm. which one is valence when it comes to that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, you have to feel single. That's the rule. You have to feel electrons single first. Just the same way everybody must be single before you get married. You have to single first before you pay. So that mean, for example, let's say this uh the this uh valence uh thing uh, elements is like uh six. You first put four, then you bring it to you now start attaching it. So how many will now be unpaired? I'll do uh, it here now for what you just said now. One, two, two three, three, four, four, then uh, five, one, six. So how many is unpaired two, now? Two. So that helps you. But if you have doubled it, it makes it confusing oh, to you. You would think uh, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. You think exactly. he's paid. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense now? So now sense. the number of unpaired electron in this place, which is the valence, is two. So that's why carbon can oxygen can make two bonds. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right, let's go. You see, I have more. This is a lot, sir. How many questions are you giving us? <laughs> All right. How many questions is the exam? 50 questions, Chris. <laughs> yeah. I'll stop really... there for. I'll be fast now. I will stop there now. No, no, for... no. We're not complaining. We're... I'm just no, no, I know you are not complaining. No, I'm also watching time for you. Uh, I mean, so the let me go to chapter three now, real quick. This chapter three. I'll be fast now, talk about a few things I need to talk about. Then, uh, I, mean, I know I'm stressing some things. I know I already know some things already. Anyway, 
I, I just feel this will help you point in. Now, key thing for chapter three, know the organelles. This is chapter three. Know these organelles and the function that they perform. And so these are the organelles, right? So each of those organelles here, know the organelles and the function that they perform. Those organelles, know them and their functions. Um, that's key for, you see those organelles, know the organelles and their function. That's key for chapter three. That's the major thing, chapter three anyway. The organs and their function, once you know that, then you may be almost good. I think that's the major thing uh, that will, yeah. Then this thing as well, transportation, know it very well. This transportation, you see membrane transport, passive, active, vesicular. Know what is passive, know what is active, know what is uh, not active. I think that's key thing. Know this slide very well. This slide, know it very well. Uh, let me see if there's any other thing I still want to point. Yeah, know this slide very well. Know it very well, like your palm. That's chapter three. Um, microfilament, um, it's part of the cytoskeletal thing. Passive transport, I talk about that mitochondria, those functions of organelles. I think that's a major thing. What's the difference between a gene and DNA? They are the same. They are not the same. It is made from DNA. Thank you. What do you say? So DNA transfers to mRNA, then mRNA do the protein. Very good. So what's the, what is a gene? Uh, genes are located on the DNA. Like genes are proteins that indicate, like for example, like our skin color, eye color, or like Thank you. hair color. Thank you. So it will just like you see what she said. I would pick what she said to just tell you what I want to say now. You see, said a gene is located on DNA, right? So it simply means that a segment of DNA is a gene. So different gene, a segment of a DNA that code for a particular trait is a gene. So if this is DNA now, you see this portion can be a gene coding for eye color. This portion can be a gene coding for height. This portion can be a gene coding for skin color. This portion, you see, on this one now, this is the camera. This is a gene. This is a gene for the lens. Does that make sense? So take about it that the entire thing is a stretch of DNA. Now, the whole big thing is called chromosome. But each segment of the DNA that code for a particular trait is a gene. So gene is not just something arbitrary. So you say the gene for the shape of the nose, the gene for the texture of the hair. Gene is for a specific trait, but the segment of a DNA that makes up a particular, a code for a particular trait is called a gene. So take note of that. Very, very important. Now, take note. Um, let me see what I still want to point here. Crenation. I think it is here. Um, is it here? Maybe on the transportation. Okay, cool. Uh, is it cool? Yeah. Okay. So take note of these terminologies. Crenation. Crenation. Emolysis, take note of all of that. Be able to identify it if I ask you what um, that is. Be able to tell me. Um, so,
Um, all right. I think that's that for chapter three. So please take note of that very well. Know what, read this slide very well. Understand very well what cremation mean. Um, yeah. The process, if you remember, I talked about, I didn't talk about this too well now, but remember I talked about DNA makes RNA, right? The process when DNA makes RNA is called transcription. I'll type it here. DNA make RNA is called transcription. You could have seen something like that on your quiz, perhaps. So DNA, transcription is DNA to RNA. Then translation is RNA to protein. This is translation. I, I know I talked about it, but I, I don't think I mentioned those terminologies for you. So those are that. So I think majorly you want to take note of those things particularly. I think that, that. so chapter four now. So what do you think will be the problem of a cell that doesn't have ribosome? What will be the problem of a cell that doesn't have ribosome? Not be able to make protein. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're correct. Yeah. <laughs> I was just kidding. You want to confuse me, sir? <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> All right. So chapter four. All of those cartilages I talked about. Know what allen cartilage is. Um. Allen cartilage. Um. No know their functions areola connective tissue you already know that the you already know that areola is usually found around um uh, um you find it around, you find it around uh, that area you know that um there's something i want to say actually okay so Okay, cool. I didn't want to mention this earlier then because it's not integration system, but I have to. Do you take note that they put injection deep into your skin? They don't put it on the surface of the skin, right? They don't put it like right in the skin. They put it deep into the skin. Did you take note that? Yeah, to the muscle. They put it in the subcutaneous membrane. Subcutaneous, yeah. Thank oh. you. They put it in the subcutaneous membrane. The reason they put it in the subcutaneous membrane is this. Number one, on this, your skin is made up of um of um the connective tissue there is dense connective tissue is not loose connective tissue so you don't have areola on this skin you don't have adipose on this skin you only have reticular there the reticular there is dense it's not going to let an injection circulate worst thing you don't even have blood vessels there because blood vessels are not there, so that means they can't circulate nutrients. So, but on the subcutaneous membrane, there's blood vessels there. There is areola connective tissues there. So that's why you get injections there. So take note of that for areola. The same thing, adipose tissue is also there. Adipose tissue is there, areola is there. And of course, you know that adipose tissue is fat, right? Triglyceride, so don't forget that. Don't forget that as well, at all, at all, at all. Oh, sir, you said something about that. Uh, uh, you said uh, reticular is the one that is on our skin, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, areola, where is areola? Areola is inside. Right? Areola is also in the subcutaneous membrane. Adipose is also there. I told you anywhere you see adipose, you see, adipose areola. You see areola. Remember? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I think um, I will stop now since I just talked about. Okay, let me look at anything that I just want to say about chapter, chapter 4 before I let you go. I've kept you so long. This is 9 p.m. already. So I've talked about the functions. Um, yeah, I've talked about tendons, ligaments, the container, dense um, connective tissues. They don't contain dense irregular. They contain dense regular. 
right? Which one? Sorry, which one did you say, Nasa? Tendon and ligaments. I told you tendon. Yes. I even used my leg as example. You remember? Yeah. They contain yeah, yeah. dense, dense regular. Yeah. Dense regular. Dense yeah. regular. That's why they are tough. Dense regular. Uh, tissues. Yeah. So I think at this point I will stop. Um B oh last thing or maybe one thing I'll say before I go. Cell junctions. Go back here, make sure you know this very well. These cell junctions, understand the images. Understand the images to be able to answer questions. Understand those images, know what desmosome is by the image, know what tight junction is by the image, know what cell gap junction is by the image. That will help. All right, I think I will stop. I don't think I should still be talking about chapter four again since we just talked about this here as well. Um, you already know what is voluntary control or involuntary control. I've explained all of that to you while we talk about chapter four. All right, let me ask now, do you have any question you want to ask me? No, I'm sorry I've kept you this long. Not really. Okay, um, the video the video will not be generated immediately to take, maybe sometimes it could take 30 minutes or more. So, but I will ensure I post it tonight so that you can still refer to it as well. Fatima, you have a question for me. There is, any, there is duration for the test? The test is going to be between 65 and 70 minutes. Uh, you're going to make it 90 minutes for us. Yes. No. <laughs> there is a specific time to attend the test. I, I don't want to waste your time. What is that? There is a specific time to attend the test. You said to do the test? Yeah, there is a specific time we have to do the test. Uh, I'm going to open it on Sunday and it will close on Monday at 11.59 p.m. So you can decide to do it anytime within the period. Okay. And then one more question. Uh, no need for camera, right? No, there will be there will be need. I'm going to send out a test just to prep you for what it's going to look like. I should mo I may look, likely send that today, just to prep you for what um is going to be like. The 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 you will require it will require. I would send a test. It's not going to be graded. It's not anything. It's just to prep you for what the test is going to be like. What the okay. what the lockdown browser will be like. It will require lockdown browser with camera with uh, webcam, uh, everything. What did you say? The, one, say I'm gonna, the one I'm going to send is just for you to um, practice. Yeah, or maybe I should grade it so that people will do it. Ah. Because if it's not graded, people won't do it and we don't know who needs help or not. <laughs> Extra point. Hey, uh, yeah, maybe I will make it extra points. Okay, 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 okay. That's uh, good. That's good. It, it will be required because if not, people will not do it. Then on the test, they will not have challenge. Okay, so I think that. So, so you didn't answer. You didn't say anything about my request. It's not possible. Which of your requests for ninety minutes? That will be wasting your time. I don't want to keep you on the time on the exam unnecessarily. Uh, maybe like eight. You have to that. <laughs> I had one to eat. So six, it will be between sixty-six minutes and seventy-one minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. I will. Uh, yes, we can move after. So once, if you don't have any questions for me, then you can let me stop recording. Now, before you go, sir, the one you want to give us.